Hey, Keller, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your home in Houston, Texas. You are a lecturer at the University of Houston teaching biological anthropology and human variation classes to undergraduates. Your passion is teaching anthropology in fun and relatable ways through your social media pages under Bones and BioAnth. So, Kate, how have you been doing during these uh, difficult times? Has lockdown given you time to reach out to even more curious minds through uh, Bones and BioAnth. Well, first, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, Bones and BioAnth is a little science communication project that I actually started during quarantine. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty young still. I started it in April. And um, in quarantine, you know, I'm pretty bored, not a lot to do. Um, yep. And I wanted to share kind of what I had been teaching in my classes. Uh, I I had the idea for a, a while. I just hadn't had kind of the, the time to start it. So uh, I guess that's kind of one good thing that came out of this uh, quarantine was I was able to start my project. And um, what I really want to achieve with it is just bringing these topics that I find really fascinating to a wider audience and kind of taking some of the esoteric academic language out of it and just making mm. it really easy to understand um, that's important with successful science communication and I don't think all scientists are very good at communication especially with the general public and that can cause you know many different problems um, and I think just being scientifically literate is important so that's the aim with Bones and BioAnth uh, I write blog posts that break down and explain a number of different topics in biological anthropology. Um, and then with my social media, that's just um, kind of to streamline those ideas. Again, just to bring biological anthropology to a wider audience and explain it a little bit um, easier. It shouldn't be locked up, you know, behind a paywall or in a university. Um, so that's that's my goal with it. Okay, today we're going to be talking about the concept of race or ethnicity, uh, what is meant by those terms, if there actually is such a thing as race within humanity, and what the biology tells us. Now, you've explored this subject in your ongoing series, Why Race Isn't Biological, on bonesandbioanth.com. It can be a very controversial subject, so how about we start with looking at this concept of biological race. How has so-called race been viewed uh, historically up until today? Well, great question, and that is a really big question, actually. <laughs> um, and it's complex. The history of race is complex. It's a complex subject. Um, really, you have to go all the way back to kind of the Enlightenment age in Europe. Um, big ideas were happening during this time. We're having the scientific revolution. So there's a lot of emphasis on science, on understanding the natural world, and then there's also a lot of emphasis on understanding humans and their place in the natural world. Um, so scientists and scholars and thinkers during this time period are working on, on those concepts. Um, and really, sort of the idea of a biological race can be traced back to Carl Linnaeus, mm -hmm. and he's your, your father of taxonomy. Um, so taxonomy is the science of naming and classifying uh, plants and animals. And we still use his taxonomic systems to this day. Uh, so he was busy doing that as other human groups were encountered on other continents. He essentially put them into categories, into races, uh, and tried to classify them that way as well. He um, gave us four races or types um, and so essentially he was basing these these races or types on 
continents or on geographic origin for the, the people. Right. And by doing this, since he was already a, a well-known scientist who had already classified much of the natural world, um, he formalized this sort of distinction, these categories of, of races, these four categories. Um, and later on in, in the 1770s, we have another scholar, another scientist. His name is Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. He was very interested in studying human variation as well. He was looking at mostly the, the shape and size of human skulls. And he took the work of Linnaeus a step further. He, um, he came up with actually five racial categories based mm. somewhat on geographic origin, but also including a lot of our physical characteristics, things like skin color. Um, and he actually divided these by colors that we still essentially use today for our so-called mm. racial groupings. Um, and he came up with terms we still use as well, such as Caucasian. Um, ah. From a single skull he found in the Caucasus Mountains, um, he decided this would be the, the, the type specimen for Caucasians or the white race. So this is another important scholar that's kind of doing work during this time period. This, this even goes so far as to potentially categorize these races into different species or subspecies, which of mm -hmm. course today we know is not the case. All humans alive belong to a single species. Um, but there was uh, sort of these two opposing viewpoints, um, one of which was the idea of a single creation event, uh, monogenesis. So that would be all humans um, were created at the same time. And since this is coming from white European thought, uh, any other group outside of white European would be essentially a degeneration of this original race. Uh, huh. So not good there. And the opposite <laughs> of that would be um, polygenesis, which is essentially that human races are different species. They were separate creation events. So we have these two kind of philosophies also bouncing around during this time period. Essentially, this is like an attempt to almost justify things like colonialism, things like slavery at the time. It's a lot easier to have these practices if you can somehow say that these other groups are somehow inferior, especially if you can kind of back it up with so-called mm. biology. So, and there's there's a lot more to that discussion than than that. But those are our, our really deep roots of of where this this scientific idea of race comes from. Well, the real place to look when we need answers to this difficult subject is the human story itself and how we have changed over millions of years. So how has human evolution and human migration over the earth determined the variations we see within people today? So all modern Homo sapiens evolved in Africa roughly 300,000 years ago. And these modern Homo sapiens at the time would have had dark skin. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to take the story a little bit further back than that, actually, to our hominin and proto-hominin ancestors. And these earliest ancestors would have been chimp-like. They would have had body fur to help protect them from the sun. And they would have lived mostly in tropical forested environments. Um, and underneath the, this body fur, they would have had lighter skin, much like we see in chimpanzees today. Um, so when you get to the end of the Miocene, you start to have some significant climate change events. Um, it becomes cooler and drier. You have forests diminishing, and you have the spread mm -hmm. of what's called savanna land, which is kind of this mixed environment. So you have patches of forested area and then large swatches of just grassland. Um, and so during this time, we also see the emergence um, of obligate bipedalism. Um, we see the loss of this body hair. Uh, and this body hair has been protection from the sun. And by losing it, this really jump-started the process of natural selection for a darker skin pigmentation. 
as protection. Mm -hmm. It's an adaptation um, to a high UV environment, essentially. And it's important to note, too, though, that Africa is a really large place, and it's, mm -hmm. it's really varied. So we have other variants at play as well. Um, this, this variant for lighter skin tone doesn't go away entirely. It's still present in our ancestors. Uh, and then later on, as groups like Homo erectus are moving out of Africa, and later on, modern Homo sapiens are moving out of Africa, they still have variants for both light and dark pigmentation. And so as they move to northern latitudes away from the equator, the ultraviolet radiation becomes less intense, so there's less of a selective pressure for this dark pigmentation. And over many thousands of years, we can start to see lighter variants emerging. Um, but it takes a long time. Um, and things like diet also play a role. For example, Inuit populations alive today tend to have darker pigmentation than you would expect from living in a northern latitude. Um, and this is partly because they have a diet really high in vitamin D. Uh, so they don't need to synthesize vitamin D from the sun like uh, those with lighter pigmentation have to. Mm -hmm. And this could also be because they've arrived in these northern latitudes roughly 7,000 years ago. And maybe it's not enough time yet for kind of selection to happen. Because again, these are, are long periods of time needed to really have selective pressure occur in, in this sense. Right, so they could get lighter skin if we were to jump forward in the future a few thousand years. We would see perhaps Inuits with lighter skin. Potentially, yeah. Um, so that would be their diet, though, with the vitamin D, they don't have um, quite as much of a selective pressure to, to lose pigmentation, essentially, in that environment. Um, yes. Well, not very far from where I live is the London Natural History Museum, where the skeleton of Cheddar Man is on display, as well as the life reconstruction of this early Brit based on DNA, which surprisingly showed this individual to have had dark skin. Kate, how does Cheddar Man throw light on questions about human variation? So Cheddar Man is a really interesting example. Um, he would have been alive during what's known as the Neolithic period, um, mm -hmm. so roughly 9,000 years ago. And uh, when they found him, obviously he was just a skeleton, and they were able to actually extract some DNA from him mm -hmm. and sequence his entire genome, which is how they were able to find out about uh, phenotypic or physical traits, such as what his skin color was. Um, it would have been dark to very dark in tone, um, and his eye color would have been light. Um, they could also find other things out, like he was lactose intolerant, which means he couldn't digest dairy products. Uh, so able to find out a lot of interesting things about him and kind of surprising things, such as his skin pigmentation. Um, they found he belonged to a group known as the, the West European Hunter-Gatherers, um, mm -hmm. This would have been a group kind of out of the Middle East migrating into Europe. And he, he shows that, again, this, this process of lighter skin pigmentation would have taken quite a long time. We don't think this variant really became common in Europeans until maybe only 6,000 years ago. Oh. Um, so it's a very new... Uh, variant to this this environment light skin pigmentation you know there's oh. um another I, I don't know his name there was another skeleton found in spain i think that was roughly seven thousand years old that would have belonged mm -hmm. to this um this western hunter gatherer uh population and he also had darker skin tone um and so he was i think seven thousand years old in Spain. Um, and, and I think roughly 10% of modern Brits actually have this uh, ancestry. So they have Western hunter-gatherer ancestry. I think it was 10%. Okay.
Right. Uh, let's focus on that word variation because this is very important. People tend to put other people into boxes or categories all too often based on skin color, black, white, etc. But it's not quite as simple as that, is it? No, it's not that simple. <laughs> um, well, to start out with, it's good to have kind of a running definition of variation. So variation is just differences that exist between individuals um, or between populations of the same species. So mm -hmm. all species have inherent variation. Um, humans, of course, have variation. Um, it's interesting, we have much less genetic variation than most other species, um, which people always find surprising because um, mm. we think we look so much different. We, we have very many visible or physical variations um, in appearance. So it, it's surprising to know that we have such low genetic variation. Um, I think our closest non-human primate relative, the chimpanzee, has mm -hmm. roughly four to 10 times more genetic variation um, within groups in Africa than is seen in human groups across the globe. So we're very, very similar genetically. Um, despite appearances. Yeah, it's, it's not so simple. So most human traits that are physical traits that we can see and observe, um, they would be what's called continuous traits. Mm -hmm. um, so you can think of these as a gradient. Um, right. So if you, so like, for example, the so-called racial trait of skin color, um, if you were to hypothetically walk from sub-Saharan Africa north um, into northern Europe, you would observe a gradient of different skin colors from dark to light. There wouldn't really be an easily uh, dividing line between these, these colors because there isn't one. It doesn't exist in nature. Uh, so it's a, it's a gradient. The opposite of this would essentially be discontinuous traits. Um, an example in humans would be blood types. So you can either have a blood type of A, B, AB, or O. Um, there are no intermediates between these types. You're one or the other. Um, and what's interesting about these discontinuous traits is they also don't correlate at all with our so-called racial groupings. Um, so you can't use that as an example. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so so so-called traits like skin color we think of them and we categorize them into boxes, black, white, so on, but it's not that simple. Um, it's a continuous gradient mm. of different shades, essentially. And this is true of pretty much any trait that's considered a racial or so-called racial trait. Kate, uh, what about undergrads today in 2020? How do your students respond uh, when you bring up this subject? Um, well, there's a lot of confusion around the term race uh, and a lot of misconceptions, but there's also a lot of curiosity. People want to know about it. Um, and I think part of what makes it confusing is um, we've essentially been told that um, all humans are the same. We're all mm -hmm. one race, the human race. So we have that on one hand, but then it's juxtaposed against the reality of people being treated differently and being often mistreated based on um, race, essentially. So this, this kind of juxtaposition, I think, is confusing a lot of people. Um, and, and with my students also, I see um, kind of stereotyping behavior, mm. uh, which again comes from misconceptions primarily. Um, but so stereotyping such as saying certain races are um, better at certain things. The one I get a lot is um, here in America would be that black or African American individuals are more athletic. They can perform at athletics better than the other so-called races. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really common one that I hear a lot. And to address that one just briefly, there are certain genetic variants that do seem to improve 
athletic performance, but these again don't correlate in any way to our so-called racial groups. All right, let's go a little bit more into how environment can change human appearance. After all, a person whose ancestors have always lived near the equator is visibly quite different from a person who has lived generations in, say, um, Siberia, correct? Yes, definitely correct. Um, so I do want to shout out Nina Jablonski for this one because she has a fabulous TED Talk that explains this ah. so well. So if you haven't heard it, highly recommend um, looking that up. But um, to essentially summarize from her points, um, the pigment that's responsible for our uh, skin tone is known as melanin. Um, so people have differing amounts of melanin. If you have more melanin, you're going to have a darker pigmentation. And melanin is produced by special cells in the skin. These are photosensitive or light sensitive cells called melanocytes. Mm -hmm. And everyone has the same number of melanocytes, essentially. The differences in skin pigmentation come from how much melanin the melanocytes are actually mm -hmm. producing. And this is going to vary depending on both on your genetic ancestry as well as on um, geographic origins, on environmental factors. Um, so the more you, UV or ultraviolet radiation exposure you have, the more melanin you're going to create. Um, so, and, and melanin is the pigment involved in skin tone, but it's also the pigment involved in hair color and eye color as well. Um, darker pigmentation is going to be a protection in these high ultraviolet radiation environments. Um, so things like skin cancer um, are a concern. There's also something called folate. Um, folate's really an essential vitamin for the production of things like uh, sperm. It really helps in reproductive success. Uh, if you have low folate, you're gonna have things like low sperm count and have things like uh, low birth weight or birth defects. And folate is photosensitive. So folate can be destroyed by too much sun exposure. Mm -hmm. So there's really a strong selective pressure to protect not only against things like skin cancer, but also to protect your folate levels in these high ultraviolet radiation environments. Um, so in lower ultraviolet radiation environments towards the poles or in northern latitudes. Um, ultraviolet radiation, it's going to be less intense there, so there's less of that strong selective pressure to have a lot of mel melanin, to have a lot of uh, darker pigmentation. So you see um, lighter pigmented skin, and this is also, um, since there's less sunlight in these higher uh, latitudes um, and also less sunlight hours overall, especially in winter months, mm. uh, things like vitamin D deficiency becomes a problem. Oh. So we synthesize vitamin D from sunlight. Uh, if you don't get enough vitamin D, you're at risk of things like rickets uh, during development or osteoporosis later on. Um, also, cell replication relies heavily on vitamin D, uh, as well as your mood. Your mental health is also mm. reliant on vitamin D. So there's kind of an evolutionary trade-off happening, essentially. Um, so between these skin pigmentations and folate and vitamin D, um, so to paraphrase, kind of in high UV environments, you want to have that darker pigmentation, it's protective, you're protecting folate levels and you're protecting against things like skin cancer. And then in the lower UV environments, um, you don't have such um, risk of things like skin cancer, you don't have to protect folate, but you do uh, need to synthesize more vitamin D from the sun. So it's, a, it's an evolutionary trade-off happening. Um, and it's really cool though because to paraphrase again, Nina Jablonski, um, human skin color is proof of evolution right on your own body. 
Um, so I think that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so as we were saying about melanin, melanin's uh, the pigment that gives us different skin colors, but it also um, affects eye color. So if you have a lot of melanin production, mm. you're going to have darker um, eye pigment. Um, Things like blue eyes, you don't have the melanin production happening. Um, so essentially that gives you the lighter eye color. And uh, it's the same with, with hair tone, hair color as well. Yeah, for instance, there are people who say you will never get dark skinned people with blue eyes or green eyes, but that's not true, is it? No, yeah, that's not true. Um, that's another kind of misconception that uh, that comes from sort of the idea that Again, that race is biological, that you get these so-called racial traits as packages. Um, and that's, that's, of course, not true. Um, we tend to measure the so-called racial groups using primarily skin color. Um, but, of course, you can have a darker skin pigmentation and have a lighter eye color because um, essentially these aren't packaged together. They're not genetically mm. linked. Um, so, yeah, that's that's an, an interesting thing to bring up. And it does go back to kind of so much confusion and misconceptions around oh, yeah. um, the idea of race. Uh, another one that people often say is nose shape and size. So they tend mm. to um, lump having like a larger, wider nose with being black or being darker pigmented. And that's not the case. The people that are descended from the continent of Africa, groups there have both the widest and the narrowest noses out of any human population. So it doesn't, just because you have one so-called racial trait doesn't mean um, that you get the full package, so to speak. So overall, Kate, would you say that race is not a thing? Uh, I would say that race is not a biologically valid concept. Um, but race as a social construct is very mm. real. Um, race as an experience is real. Um, and just because something is socially constructed um, is not to suggest it's not real. Um, and the thing about social constructs like race, um, even though they're not based in biology, the impacts of them can actually affect our biology. Um, so essentially we've, we've made race a real thing. Um, and humans, of course, we're, uh, we're biocultural beings. So of course we can't escape biology entirely. We are biological organisms, but we have this extra layer of culture that is incredibly important to humans. Um, so I would say it's important to understand why race isn't biologically valid, but um, race is very real socioculturally. Okay, so what about future generations? Now, human beings live very differently to how our ancestors lived. We stare into computer screens, uh, whiz around the world on planes, mess around with our genetics, etc. So how do you see humanity changing or perhaps stagnating uh, due to these cultural innovations? Great question. Um, so with the idea of culture, we often like to think that we've somehow beaten biology. Um, and actually, that's not the case. Um, humans are still very much evolving. Um, and rather than slowing down or stagnating, we've actually accelerated human evolution. Um, things like cultural innovations tend to accelerate evolution. Um, just one example would be advances in medical care. Mm. Um, so now that we have the, this cultural innovation of medical care, we have more individuals living longer and reproducing, and that's giving us more variation to work with. Um, more variation, um, of course, kind of accelerates evolutionary processes. Um, so we do have evolution seen as accelerating uh, more recently, which is interesting. Um, you mentioned kind of that we're essentially 
staring at computer screens a lot and we're we're traveling a lot more we're living in different environments than we ever have um mm. before uh so that's an interesting thing to note because that's relatively recent as well so we don't entirely see kind of the end result of this um but for example we just spoke about kind of the evolution of human skin color and why different skin pigmentation is advantageous in different mm -hmm. environments. So now we have humans that have a certain skin pigmentation that's ideal for one environment, living in environments that might be completely opposite to um, their skin tone. And that gives, of course, a number of problems. Um, if you have a lighter skin pigmentation and you are now living in a high ultraviolet radiation environment, um, of course, you're going to be at risk for things like skin cancer. Yeah. Uh, you have to watch out for that folate destruction that we were talking about. Photo damage is really um, something you have to watch out for if you're lighter pigmented. Uh, if you're darker pigmented and you're living at a northern latitude, um, or like you said, spending too much time indoors, kind of looking at computer screens, um, we're all kind of stuck in offices and we're not really getting outside very much. This can essentially increase issues with that vitamin D deficiency we were mm. talking about. Um, so if you have a darker pigmented skin tone and you're in this low ultraviolet radiation environment, um, potentially you're, you're not getting sufficient vitamin D. Um, so you might need to watch that and supplement that as well. Um, again, that's super important for cell health, um, cell replication, uh, and also for your mental health as well. Um, so very important. And I know people are going to ask, uh, if not um, in the comments, perhaps later on down the line, they're going to say that, you know, people are, are generally taller now than, say, in the Middle Ages uh, due to perhaps medicines and better diet. I mean, would you agree with that? Yes, definitely. People are, on average, getting taller from that. Um, and, and that's interesting because that sort of plays into the idea that um, environment is very important. So we have uh, essentially our genetic potential for height. And then if for whatever reason our environment, um, maybe something like our diet, isn't really giving us the, the proper amount of nutrients to reach that genetic potential, then yeah, we're going to be you know, shorter. Mm -hmm. um, I might have the genetic potential to be six feet tall, but you know, maybe something happens in my diet and I, I'm only yeah. five foot three or something. So yeah, so our diets yeah. are improving and, and health is improving. Um, and yeah, so one thing we're seeing is, is an increase in um, ultimately in, in your height. Because I know here in England, we have a lot of castles and they have like uh, suits of armor. And I remember even as a child thinking they're really small. They're not like <laughs> the six foot, you know, guys you see in the movies. So. Right. Yeah, that's going to come down to um, a lot of environmental factors like a better diet overall. Well, this is a very important topic, and no doubt it will inspire a lot of discussion and arguments. Uh, it's a subject that needs to be talked about as well as understood, and you certainly are contributing in a positive way to this very big conversation. I will leave links to your social media in the description below. And hopefully, Kate, we can have you back on to Evolution Soup one day in the future. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.